Hello again, this is Dave Burkus for the Burkus Report and Burkonomics. I'm pleased to bring you business tips, business tips that come from entrepreneurs who have succeeded wildly and succeeded or failed, and each of which has a message to learn. Today we're going to talk about raising cash and the ways in which you can do it right and perhaps do it wrong. The first thing to talk about is what are the sources of cash as you look for the cash that you need. Sometimes, and especially with early stage businesses, we start with friends and family money, or we take a mortgage on our house, or we borrow from our credit cards, but we find ways except using other third party money. Once this business has begun and you begin to prove to yourself and maybe to others that the business can succeed and make money, it is time to think about whether or not you need third party money to succeed. That money can come from angel investors, angel groups, it comes from Kickstarter campaigns or other forms of crowdsourcing. There are many ways of getting those kinds of funds, but you'll know that in almost all of those cases, except perhaps a Kickstarter campaign today, you've got to give up some control and you'll have to know that you have to formalize many more of the business practices than you've had before. It's important to know that you are yourself until you've taken money from others, at which time you really belong to other people as well as yourself. So those are a few of the sources of early stage money. There are larger sources for larger amounts, but I think that those are things that most of those kinds of business people know for themselves. So let's move on to what happens when you take money from friends and family and then go to professional money as your second source. We who are professional investors often call this the dirty cap table, a term you've never heard before because we invented it. But what it means is sometimes you will take money from friends and family who are willing to give you money at a valuation much higher than the professional investor will ever give you for the same company. And when we look at that, we often have to worry about whether or not we have to go to those investors who have come to you earlier and invested in you and tell them that we're about to give them a reduction in the value of their investment. It's a very uncomfortable conversation. But it's one that we have to have sometimes to clean up the company to allow other investors who have a more professional attitude begin to invest in that company. And we call it the dirty cap, tail, cap table because we have to clean it up. So why not start with an investment from friends and family at a reasonable value? Why not start by having somebody else help you value that company at the original investment to make sure that those first investors are not burned? And we see at that time a cap table that seems reasonable and there is no renegotiation necessary. It's a much, much wiser way to start an early stage business and to reward those who gave you the money at the most risk at the earliest time. The last thing I want to talk about today in this short episode is the every three million dollar crisis. The every three million dollar crisis. There are three predictable crises in early stage businesses. And you may have experienced some already, but let's just talk about them quickly. First of all, assume you have enough money to start. That's not a crisis. You wouldn't have begun business in the first place. But you get to about $3 million of gross revenue, or you get to about 20 employees. And the first crisis is you as an entrepreneur rarely have a span of control wide enough to be able to manage those employees. And you need, for the first time perhaps, somebody in a layer below you to do that management job. The problem is very few entrepreneurs know how to delegate and to give up all of that responsibility. And it is a risk to the company because some entrepreneurs don't survive that particular problem. And it is the first of the problems and we'll call it organizational as the first crisis. The second crisis happens about double that volume. Maybe it's 40 employees, maybe it's $6 million in revenue, but typically it happens when you find that you have shipped so much in the way of services or products into the marketplace. The quality is no longer the quality that you thought you had to have when you first began in the business. And that quality suffers a bit. And the first people that notice that are the salespeople for your competitors. You know, it takes a long time to recover from one of those quality problems. And it's one of those things you just need to know in advance. It is a crisis you will have. The third and final one, after you've gone through the crisis of organization and the crisis of quality, is the crisis that is financial. It's not the one that I need to raise cash in order to grow. I need to raise cash in order to stay in business. That may sound a little bit strange, but what happens if you have a receivable that is one or two months old, but you pay your rent and your payroll in advance of that? You have to pay money out before you receive money in at ever higher steps when those businesses are increasing in size. And so you can do a calculation. 
If you're doing, let's say, uh, $100,000 a month worth of business and you have $100,000 of receivables, but you've prepaid the rent and you've paid your payroll on the way up, you may need $100,000 worth of extra working capital in order to continue in business, let alone to grow. So think about those three crises. They happen in order. You have the ability to solve the problems before they happen because you know they're coming in advance, you know the way in which they come, and you know the approximate time in which they come. Why not plan for them and reduce their effectiveness by knowing in advance and planning in advance? So three things we've talked about today, the sources of financing, the dirty cap table, and the $3 million crisis. Three things to think about. This is Dave Burkus for the Burkus Report and Burkonomics.